our desire is to encourage and to give you a view of what it took to bring life to the point where you now are able to enjoy it. And to have you be encouraged today to understand that no matter how dismal, how dark, how difficult, how unfair situations can be, you still have the ability to press on through it and accomplish great things. Somebody raise their hand with me and say, no matter what, I didn't hear you, no matter what, happens to me, there's greatness in me. Yes. And so now the Performing Arts Ministry is gonna to come to you with our presentation of From Shore to Shore. Sit back, enjoy, eat up, take in all that you can. And I believe it will truly be a blessing to you so that when you leave this place, you will say, it was good for us to have been here. Come on, give yourselves a hand. Clap. This is music that is an element of black heritage. With its clear, distinct sound, it speaks of a new day, a new level of life. In its rhythm is the cadence of persistence and patience. In its harmonies are found an assurance of divine support. Upon its melodies flow lyrics of determination, hope, and faith. As with most things in life, the deepest and most meaningful work in you is accomplished by the most difficult and darkest trials you come through. Today, we will examine where we have been so that we can appreciate where we are and with greater determination, focus upon where we need to go. You know, for centuries, many immigrant groups have come to the shores of America and through hard work and per perseverance, quickly gained the status of first-class citizenship. One group of people has been the clear exception. Their struggle has been a long and hard struggle. Though the cast of characters are described as black and white, it is a story about wrong and right. A struggle that dates back to the beginning of time. We begin our presentation during the 1600s on the continent of Africa. descent. Africa was the birth of nations with a rich history of science, mathematics, and technology.
breaking trade. Breaking trade, that's what it's called. After permission was granted, the captains would go ashore to examine the Negroes that were to be sold at markets in Africa. Several thousand are frequently sold who had been collected from all parts of the country. While I was upon the coast during one of the voyages I made, the black traders brought down in different canoes from 12 to 1,500 Negroes, which had been purchased at just one fair. As soon as the wretched Africans fall into the hands of the black traders, they experience an earnest of those dreadful sufferings which they are doomed in future to undergo. And there is not the least room to doubt, but that before they can reach these fairs, great numbers perish from cruel usage, want of food, traveling through inhospitable deserts. And after they become the property of the Europeans whom, as a more civilized people, more humanity might naturally be expected, find their treatment just as cruel and abusive. The men Negroes, on being brought aboard the ship, are immediately fastened together too, and too, by handcuffs on their wrists, and an iron riveted on their leg. They are then sent down between decks and placed in a compartment, partitioned off for that purpose. The women and the girls likewise are placed in a separate compartment between decks, but without being ironed. And an adjoining compartment is appointed for the boys. Thus, are they stowed so close as to permit of no other posture than lying on their sides. Neither will the height between decks, unless directly under the grating, permit them from being able to stand. The hardships and inconveniences suffered by the Negroes during the voyage can scarcely be enumerated or conceived. They are more violently affected by seasickness than the Europeans. It frequently ends in death, especially among the women. But the exclusion of fresh air it's the most intolerable situation of all. The fresh air being excluded. The Negro's rooms very soon grows intolerably hot. The confined air is made poisonous by the effluvia exhaled from their bodies and being repeatedly breathed. Very soon it causes fevers and sickness which generally kills off great numbers of them. I was frequently a witness to the fatal effects of this exclusion of fresh air. The loss of slaves arising from the causes I've just mentioned cannot be numbered. And the situation of the miserable beings more forcibly urges the necessity of abolishing a trade which is the source of such evils.
a little while longer, everything will be all right. Everything will be all right. You've got to fight on a little while longer, fight on a little while longer. Fight on a little while longer. Everything will be all right. Everything will be all right. Slaves sang their faith in God while they awaited that great day, the day of freedom. And that day appeared to have come with the Civil War and the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. During the decade that followed the Civil War, blacks had statewide voting majorities in several southern states. The House of Representatives in the South, in the South Carolina, became the first official body in Western civilization to have a black majority. And in Louisiana, Pinckney Benton Stewart Pinchback served as acting governor, making him the first person of African descent to serve as governor of any state. Governor Pinchback, nine years ago, President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. That was in 1873. How do you see things changing in America since then? Well, the emancipation has begun the process of freeing the slaves, but it's allowed the black people to fight in the Civil War. And what about blacks having voting majorities in Alabama, Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, and South Carolina? Well, that's how I became the 24th governor of Louisiana. Also, Mr. Blanche K. Bruce, he was one of two blacks to serve as a United States senator from the great state of Mississippi. But you were only governor for 35 days. Sometimes a small start will make a big difference. Governor, now that the House of Representatives in South Carolina has become the first official, how do you feel about it? Well, very proud, of course. I mean, for blacks to dominate Southern legislature, we could begin to build a racially free, integrated public school system. We could put into uh, social legislation that's beneficial for newly freed men and women, as well as poor white men and women. Also, under black political leadership, we could start rebuilding roads, uh, bridges, courthouses, penitentiaries. So in short, Governor, you're helping to reconstruct the South. I'd say that's a good summary because it is rising again. But how do you think that Southern slave owners will feel uh, giving up their slaves, having had them working for them for all these years? Well, to them, it's nothing more than an experiment. You see, they consider integration to be un-American. Uh, they believe that we blacks were created for their use, and now they want slavery back with free labor. Are you saying they don't want to pay slaves for all their hard work? Mm. It's a ridiculous concept, isn't it? I've heard it said that a workman is worthy of his hire. And work with no pay because of the color of your skin is wrong. So then there's truth to what I've read about southern states adopting codes which are really laws to legally re-enslave blacks. Isn't it sad? Just as the Negro has just gotten a taste of freedom, these so-called laws is just another way of stealing from Negroes. Will the segregation laws last? 
We're American citizens. We pay taxes like everyone else. These laws that separate us with Jim Crow lines from our American rights is not justice. But in the meantime, blacks will be arrested for sitting in the same restaurant with whites, using the same bathroom facilities, and drinking from the same water fountains. What about that? Well, I am groping through this American system of prejudice and proscription, and I'm determined to find some form of civilization where all men will be accepted for what they are worth. No more questions. Governor, 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 Governor. But this brief experiment was considered un-American by former slave owners who believed blacks were their created for their use and they wanted slavery back with its free labor. Southern states began to adopt codes which were laws that legally re-enslaved a people just tasting freedom. You see, Without justice, even law can become a form of theft. It became illegal to sit in the same restaurant, to use the same bathroom facility, or drink from the same water fountains, or attend the same schools. Hello? Hello, young lady. Miss Bethune, may I help you with something? You are a stateswoman, philanthropist, humanitarian, and civil rights activist. Yes, yes, and an assistant to President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Oh, yes. Please to make your acquaintance, Mr. Thune. Excuse me, Mr. Thune. I gotta take my seat. Children, come to order. Children. Who wants to tell us what they want to be when they grow up? Yes, Shirley. I want to be the first black congresswoman and serve in the House of Representatives. Ooh. How about you, Maya? I am Maya Angelo. I like to write, so I want to be a poet and write books. What about you, Oprah? I want to help people by being a journalist and have my own network. Oh, really? What about you, Condoleezza? My name is Condoleezza Rice, and I want to be the National Security Advisor to the President of the United States. Is that so? How about you, Barry? Oh, Barry, Barry. My name is Barack Obama. <laughs> At first, I want to be a Senate and then the President of the United States. <laughs> Come on now, children. Why don't y'all dream of something y'all can actually be? They always need someone who can shine shoes down by the courthouse. And you can always find a job cooking and cleaning for folk if you work real hard. Now y'all think about it, and I'll be right back. Do you children like that school? Come on now, don't shrug your shoulders. Do you like this school or not? No. Me either. Me either. But you have to speak up. Oh God. The drums of Africa beat in my heart. They will not let me, let me rest un as long as there is a single Negro boy or girl without a chance to prove their worth. I have a story for you. It will set your teacher and all you students straight. It's called A World Without Black People. And my college students will share it with you. College students, Hold please up. enter. This is a story of a little girl named Thea. Thea was curious and full of questions. She woke up one morning and asked her mother, Mom! 
were no black people in the world. Hmm. Hmm. Daughter, that is some question. Well, her mother thought about that for a long moment. Finally, she said, I wonder, what would this world be like with no black people? Hmm. We'll have to look into that. Now go get ready. We have a lot to do today. Thea ran to her room to get dressed. No black people. That is some question. When Thea came down from her room, her mother took one look at her and said, Thea, where are your shoes? Your clothes are all wrinkled. Child, we can't go out like that. You have, we have to iron them. But when she reached for the ironing board, it was no longer there because Sarah Boone, a black woman, invented the ironing board and Jan E. Matt Zillinger, a black man, invented the shoe lasting machine. Oh my, well, go and do something with your hair. Thea ran in her room to comb her hair, but the comb was not there because Walter Salmon, a black man, invented the comb. I decided to just brush my hair, but the brush was gone? Because Lydia O. Newman, a black woman, invented the brush? Well, this was a sight. No shoes, hair a mess, wrinkled clothes, even mom's hair without the hair care invention of Madam C.J. Walker. Well, you get the picture. Mom told, Mom told Thea, let's do our chores around the house and then take a trip to the grocery store. Thea's job was to sweep the floor. So she swept and swept and swept. But when she reached for the dustpan, it was not there because Lloyd P. Ray, a black man, invented the dustpan. So she kept a pile of dirt over in the corner and left it there. She then decided to mop the floor, but the mop was gone. Because Thomas W. Stewart, a black man, invented the mop. Thea yelled to her mom. Mom! I'm not having any love! I know. Well, honey, let me finish washing the clothes, and we will prepare a list for the grocery store. When the wash was finished, she went to place the clothes in the dryer, but the dryer was not there because George T. Salmon, a black man, invented the clothes dryer. Then Mom said, Thea, go get a pencil and some paper so we can prepare our list for the market. So Thea ran for the paper and pencil, but noticed the pencil lead was broken. Well, she was out of luck because John Love, a black man invented the pencil sharpener. Mom reached for a pen, but it was not there because William Purvis, a black man, invented the fountain pen. As a matter of fact, Lee Burge, a black man, invented the typewriting machine and W.A. Lovett, the advanced printing press. Thea and her mother decided to head out to the market. Well, when Thea opened the door, she noticed that the grass was as high as she was tall. You see, the lawnmower was invented by John Burr, a black man. We made our way over to the car and found that... It just wouldn't go. You see, Richard Spikes, a black man, invented the automatic gear shift. And Joseph Gamow invented the supercharged system for internal combustion engines. We noticed that the few cars that were moving were... Ooh! Ah! Ee! E. E. Running into each other and having wrecks because there were no traffic signals. Because Garrett A. Morgan, a black man, invented the traffic light. Well, it was getting late. So they walked to the market, got their groceries, and returned home. Just when we were about to put away the milk, eggs, and butter, we noticed the refrigerator was gone. You see, John Standard, a black man, invented the refrigerator. So we just left the food on the counter. By this time, Thea noticed she was getting mighty cold. Mom went to turn up the heat. And what do you know? Alice Parker, a black female, invented the heating furnace. <laughs> Even in the summertime, they would have been out of luck because Frederick Jones, a black man, invented the air conditioner. Thea was very upset and said, Where's 
Daddy, how come he's not home yet? He had to go to the hospital to visit your auntie, who may have to have open heart surgery. Hopefully Thea auntie doesn't have to get that surgery, because without Dr. Hare Williams... A black doctor who performed the first open heart surgery? Her auntie may not have any option. Not to mention, if auntie needed blood, she probably would be out of luck. Because Charles Jew, a black scientist, found a way to preserve and store blood, which led to his starting the world's first blood bank. When a dad got to the hospital, he had to take the elevator to the 15th floor. But there was no elevator, because Alexander Miles, a black man, invented the elevator. So I gotta take the steps. Up and down. After a while, Thea's dad was trying to get home, but there were more obstacles. What's taking daddy so long? Her dad said. I wonder what's taking this bus so long. But there was no bus because its precursor was the electric trolley invented by another black man, Albert R. Robinson. Well, I guess I'll have to walk. While he was walking, he remembered he had to drop off the office mail at a nearby mailbox. But it was no longer there because Philip Downing, a black man, invented the letter drop mailbox. And William Barry invented the postmarking and canceling machine. Dad became very frustrated. While back at home, Thea and her mother sat at the kitchen table with their head in their hands. Thea said, Mom, it's getting really late. Where's Dad? I know, and it's not like him not to call us. Her dad tried, but the call wouldn't go through. You see, Henry Sampson, a black inventor, pioneered the technology that is used in today's cell phone. Well, what do you know? Dad finally arrived home and he asked, why are y'all sitting in the dark? Why? Because, because Lewis Howard Latimer, a black man, invented the filament in the light bulb. Thea quickly learned what the world would be like without black people. So if you ever wonder like Thea, where would we be without us? Well, it's pretty plain to see. We, we would, would still, still be in the dark. Don't forget. Never, never forget. 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 Wow. Thank you. You will understand the importance of getting a good education because people with power either introduce ideas of truth to the minds of children or they can mess up a child's mind with ideas that are simply not true. So children, hold on to your dreams and know you can go the distance. Of a far off place Where a hero's welcome Would be waiting for me Where the crowds would cheer When they see my face And the voice keeps saying This is where I'm meant to be I'll be there someday I will find my way If I can be strong I know every mile Will be worth my while When I go the distance I'll be right where I belong Embrace my fate Though that road may wander It will lead me to you And a thousand years Would be worth the wait It may take a lifetime But somehow I see it through Till I go the distance and my journey. 
Till I find my heroes Welcome waiting in All of The greatest God-given freedom is the power of choice. And yet there were those who chose ignorance and hate. The quality of your life depends on the quality of your decisions. And there were those who knew the issue wasn't black and white, but wrong and right. Any people struggle anywhere is every people struggle everywhere. What? 1960 who? 1960 what? 1960 who? 19... Hey! The Motor City is burning That ain't right 1960 what? 1960 who? 1960 what? 1960 who? 19... Hey! The Motor City is burning, y'all of a people standing on the balcony of the Lorraine Hotel Shots rang out Yes, it was a gun He was the only one to fall down, y'all That ain't right Then his people scream Ain't no need for sunlight Ain't no need for moonlight. Ain't no need for moonlight. Ain't no need for street light. Ain't no need for street light. It's burning real bright. Some folks say we gon' fight. We gon' fight. This here thing just ain't right. Ain't right. 1960 what? 1960 who? 1960 what? 1960 who? 19. Hey, the motor.
Any people struggle anywhere is every people struggle everywhere. We need to reach down deep and find something inside, something so strong. Because if we change our thinking, mm -hmm. <laughs> we can change our world. Today, we are talking about a journey like no other. How African Americans move from the cotton and tobacco fields to great success in the fields of education, law, science, politics, business, sports, and entertainment. My brilliant guests today are not only gifted in their field of choice, but are also giving back to the communities and are proof that the quality of your life depends on the quality of your decisions. Hello, everybody. Let me introduce our guest. First up, at age 26, he is a millionaire and a multi-Grammy winner, none other than Chancellor Bennett, AKA Chance the Rapper! Also from the field of entertainment, a dynamic duo, the very successful husband and wife team, Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith! From the sports field, please help me welcome Mr. Basketball himself, NBA superstar, LeBron James! From the field of law and order, the no-nonsense judge that will set you straight, the Honorable Judge Glenda Hatchett! Last and certainly not least, from the business field, Forbes 163rd richest person in America, billionaire, and the CEO of Vista Equity Partners, Robert F. Smith! Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for coming on the show. Okay, audience, we're getting right to it. What do you have to ask our distinguished guest? Yes. Hi, Oprah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> this question is for Chance the Rapper. What's up? <laughs> Hi. So, <clears throat> I read an article that you not only talk the talk, but you walk the walk when it comes to giving back. What inspired you at such a young age to give back to your community? And what have you given? <laughs> Well, first, I know how difficult it can be to get started in the arts. So I decided to raise money for the Chicago Public School Arts Program. I started a nonprofit called Social Works. And what we did is we challenged companies to pledge $100,000 each. And do you know how much we raised? $2.2 million. Yeah. yeah. And I also pledged a million dollars of my own money to mental health services because Across this country, millions of people are affected by mental health conditions every year, yeah. from anxiety to depression to post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. You know, in the black community, we don't talk about it enough. Absolutely. You know, it's serious, and sometimes you need a little help. You feel me? Yes, that is so lit! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's lit. Okay, we have another question over there, yes? Good morning, Oprah. Good morning. So my question is for Judge Hatchett. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so my question for you is, what do you say to females who are told that they cannot make it in certain fields? Mm. 
When they tell you you can't because you're a woman, you tell them you can because you are a woman. When they tell you that you can't because you come from a certain place or you've been born poor or you had to overcome some struggles, you tell them that that's the old story. You tell them that you are writing your own story of hope and of empowerment. You see, that's the real challenge. They don't know how you got here. They don't know what it took for you to get here. So I dare you. I double dare you. I double dog dare you <laughs> to write your own story. The world needs to hear your story. Be blessed. Thank you. Wow. You go, Judge Asher. <laughs> Next question. Gentleman in the blue. My question is for LeBron James. Yes. Mr. James, you were such a great basketball player and an, and an inspiration to people like me. Yes. As you use your yes. platform yes. to empower others. Sort of a little tongue-tied. Celebrities here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, when someone had the nerve, no, the audacity to write some racist graffiti on your house in Los Angeles, mm. how'd you deal with that? I mean, how do you stay focused? Good question. How do you stay focused? Well, Oprah's not easy. But you know, I'm from the hood, Oprah. I'm from, I'm from Akron, Ohio. Okay. Akron. West, West, West Philly. Philly, you know. Oh. I know, you man. No, brother. Know. It's rough, man. Philadelphia, for real. Left Philadelphia, born and raised on the playground. It's where uh -oh. I spent most of my, my day. day. Chilling out, maxing, relaxing, all cool and all shooting, sun, be ball, I'm the sun of the school. Where the devil look at? They were acting up good. Later. 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 Don't, don't encourage hey. her. Don't encourage her. Come on. Don't encourage her. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. All right. You, you got me. You got me. <laughs> 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 nice, Jada. But you know, no matter what, no matter how famous you are, no matter how much money you have, no matter how many people admire you, being black in America is tough. Yes. Yes. But you know, no matter what, I try to make sure I give back to my hometown and community organizations. I try to be respectful of others. I believe if you do that consistently, it'll come back to you. Yes. Absolutely. You're not only a great ball player, you're a great man of integrity. I admire you. Oh, thank you, man. Give me love for that question. Great. Yeah. I got another question for you. Yeah. <laughs> Who do you admire? Hmm. Well, my business partner Maverick Carter and I are pledging a donation to the Smithsonian Museum for African American History and Culture for one of my greatest inspirations, Muhammad Ali. Yeah. 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 Muhammad Ali was indeed the greatest boxer of all time. Why not a basketball player like yourself? You know, I could have, but Muhammad Ali speaks to me because he's such a, he was a, uh, he's such a great athlete, he's a cornerstone for me, for what he, for what he stood for, mm -hmm. what he spoke for, and his demeanor. Yeah. So I want athletes to feel like they have the power. They have the platform to speak about whatever they want. Yeah. It could be something as powerful as talking about Trayvon Martin, yeah. or something as simple as what kind of socks you're gonna wear in the morning. Mm -hmm. We have so many young people that look up to us, so to have this platform means everything to me. You know, Mr. Lonnie Bunch, the director of the African American Museum, I do. he says that your support encourages athletes to realize how important athletics are in terms of social justice. But Nelson Mandela had that revelation years ago in South Africa with the rugby game. There you go. Mm -hmm. Next question, lady in red. Oh my God, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Oprah. I just love your show. Hi, everybody. Hey. Will, Jada, hey. love you guys. Thank you. Thank and you. I need your help. I need to know, do you find it difficult as a Hollywood couple to work in the same business? Wow. Look. Okay. Yeah. I got this. I got this. One. <laughs> That's a great, great question. And I'm going to let Jada answer that. Uh, you, know what? <laughs> Sit down. you know what yes it can be and it has been difficult at times I, I confess I have had some betrayals of the heart 
both of us have. Yes, so yes. within my journey, what I had to realize was that I had to find all the peace, joy, and love within my heart in order to bring it to the table to share. Yes, and, and, and I had to do the same thing. But let me just say this. I was devastated. It felt worse than a divorce. How so? Because we broke up within our marriage. So you didn't actually leave each other? No, no, Oprah. But we had to change our mindset, mm -hmm. and we had to rebuild with new rules and do things way completely different, different. for it to work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think all couples like um, Ruby D and Ozzy Davis. Denzel and Pauletta Washington. Steph and Aisha Curry. Uh, Beyonce, Beyonce and Jay-Z. Jay they'll all tell you that marriage, especially in this business, is not easy. It takes work. That's right, that's right. And Oprah, may I add something? Uh, sure. Jada, Hurry up, this isn't your Red Table Talk show. You know what, Joker? <laughs> Stay seated. Um, you know, in Hollywood, you, you hear things. You hear rumors, you read things, and some of it may be true. And, and some of it may not be true. I mean, shoot, a lot may not be true, you know what right, I'm saying? That's right, that's <laughs> right. But if you are willing to do better, you cannot dwell on the past. You cannot listen to what people say. You have to be willing to move forward in order to win. Yes. Thank you. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know, Maya Angelou always said, when you know better, you, you do, do better. better. You do better. Okay, next question. Gentlemen in the blue. Will and Jada, outside of your outstanding ability to perform, how do you give back to the community? Well, well we, we have, have a foundation, foundation called... called no. Oh, no, you, go ahead, Jada. No, no it's okay, no, Will. You're no, back to no, 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 Jada. Do you speak? Ladies first. Okay, ladies first. Right. But, but just hurry up because I want to hit a billionaire. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> we have a foundation called the Will and Jada Smith Family Foundation, which yes. is to benefit inner city community development, uh, youth educational projects, and underprivileged children and their families. Yes, and we've dedicated time and money to help mm -hmm. the suffering families and children in South Africa. That's right, and right here in our own community. You know, we gave uh, $1 million to the Baltimore School of the Arts, which is the school that Tupac and I attended back in the day. Yes, yes, we've got to give back, y'all. That's, that's right. right, that's right. Yes. Do we have another question? Okay, yes, sir. Hi, Oprah. Big fan. But this question is for Robert F. Smith. Yes, sir. First, I have to say, I was highly impressed by your very generous, generous grant for the 2019 graduating class of Morehouse, yeah. my alma mater. Yeah, big. I, and I have to say, I mean, what a blessing it was to see the joy on the faces of those what, 396 male graduates mm -hmm. graduating yeah. debt free. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, man. Yeah. And the fact that it was coming from a brother was highly inspirational. And I also understand that you are a major donor for the African American Museum. So my question to you is, why? What? Do you, do you, what generates you the, the motivation to give back to the community? Why do you even give back? And, and also, what are some of the rules that you go by to become a billionaire? <laughs> you know, uh, my mother took my brother and I to the March on Washington when we were young. Mm -hmm. And uh, we heard Dr. Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech. Now, my family had always instilled in us that our community stood for something. They were striving for something and, and, and we were a part of it. So the lifelong goal of my soul has always been, has always been to give back. Then uh, when my grandfather was 93, I, I took him to President Barack Obama's inauguration. Yeah, and, and um, while we were sitting there back in 2008, he, he, he looks up at the Senate building and points out a window in the lounge where he used to work as a young man, serving tea and coffee and taking the hats and coats of various senators that came in. And he recalled looking through that window during uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt's inauguration and not seeing a single black face in the crowd. Mm. 
So there we are, feeling the majesty of the moment of the first black president of the United States. Yeah. And my grandfather leans over to me and says, uh, America is a great place. If you're willing to work hard and, and strive forward based on a set of principles and ideas that are, that, that are important and authentic, I won't ever forget that. That being said, uh, you ready for a few new rules? Oh, yeah. No, you're not. Where's your notepad? <laughs> you better get something. <laughs> okay. I can use my phone. Okay. Here we go. Number one, develop your mind. Get smart at what you want to do. Trust yourself. People will always tell you what you can't do. Three, act on your intentions to make them manifest. Four, know your history and know that people fought for you to be able to dream big. Five, enjoy figuring things out. Research, ask questions. That means you can't always go to the party. And six, develop grit. That means develop strength in, in, in finding solutions to problems that are uniquely yours. You got all that? <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. You are welcome. And look, let me just say, I, I'm not the only billionaire around. That's we have nice. many more, like Robert L. Jones, uh, entrepreneur, media mogul, co-founder of BET, uh, businessman, uh, David Stewart, chairman and, and founder of Worldwide Technology. We all know the great Michael Jordan. Yes. And then there's is you. You can give back to your community as well. Whether it's giving a little money or, or, or teaching a class, we should all be thinking of ways that we can give back. And as I said to the 2019 class at Morehouse, on behalf of the eight generations of my family that have lived in this country, let's make sure we share the same opportunities going forward because we are enough to take care of our own communities. We are enough to make sure that we have all the opportunities of the American dream. Okay. Thank you, sir. Amen to that. And thank you to all my guests. And before we end, let me just say this with all of the gratitude in my heart. I, Oprah Gail Winfrey, who was born into poverty in rural Mississippi to a teenage single mother, would not be standing here today as an African American billionaire with my very own Oprah Winfrey Network. Had it not been for the great black leaders that have come before me and the people during the civil rights era, Great leaders like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Coretta Scott King, Rosa Parks, Adam Clayton Powell, Shirley Chisholm, James Baldwin, Malcolm X, Maya Angelou, W.E.B. Du Bois, and the list goes on and on. I hope that all of you today have connected the dots with our special guest and with the great historic figures that have brought us to this very moment in time. That includes the great Kobe Bryant, whom we just tragically lost. But his hard work for the sake of humanity still lives on. God bless you all. And in this new year, 2020, write the vision down and make it plain. And remember, always, always, Believe you can. Thank you. Many nights we prayed with no proof in you one could hear in our hearts.
a hopeful song we barely understood. Please welcome my dear friends, Deshaun, Cassandra, and Dasha. Now we are not afraid, although we know there's much to fear. We were moving mountains long before we knew we could. It's hard to kill Who knows what miracles You can achieve When you believe Somehow you will You will when you believe When prayer so often proves in vain Hope seems like the summer bird So quickly flown away So now I am standing here My heart so full I can't explain Seeking faith and speaking words I never thought I'd pray that you enjoyed yourselves today. Did anybody learn anything today? Yeah. Somebody give yourselves a round of applause if you if you took some, if you're taking something away from today. Let me say this to you. If anything you should grasp 
out of today it's this God has created each and every person and gifted them there is something inside of you that is a proclivity towards the gift that God has placed inside of you and it is really the job the role or responsibility of parents of educators of those that speak into our lives to to, to attempt to recognize what that gift is and then help you get the tools necessary to develop that gift. Because that gift needs to be developed into a skill. Because when it becomes a skill, it can be brought into the marketplace, it can be brought into the world, it can be brought into the world in such a way that it benefits everybody. Your gift wasn't given to you just for you. It's for what you are able to add to your family, to your friends, to your neighborhood, to your school, to your city, to your nation, to the world around about you. But we have to recognize and understand that that is a responsibility God has given to us. And then we push past everything that tries to stand in our way and block us from fulfilling what our call is. You feeling me? Uh, anybody in here feeling me? I, I, any, any teachers and educators in here feeling me? Yeah, you have an awesome responsibility, an awesome responsibility. And they've been talking a lot about the fact that you are not really compensated the way you ought to be for the role and the responsibility that you have taken on. But let me tell you something, you can't be God given. So as you give through your calling and what it is that you have to give to these impressionable young individuals who look to you as authorities in their life, you can't be God-given. He will see to it that you are blessed as well. I'm gonna make a change for once in my life. It's gonna feel real good. I'm gonna make a difference gonna make it right as I turn up my collar on my favorite winter coat this thing is blowing my mind I see the kids in the street without enough to eat who am I to be blind pretending not to see their needs my summer's disregard a broken Battle time and a one man soul. They follow each other on the wind, you know. Cause they got nowhere to go. That's a man I want you to know. I'm starting with that man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways. And now my sex could have been any clearer. If you wanna make this world. Selfish kind of love It's time that I realize That there are some with no home Not a nigga too long Could this be really me Pretending that they're not alone By some disregard Somebody's broken heart In a washed out dream If I love the pattern of the wind you see 
Change. It's gonna feel 